Evening, uh, gentlemen and ladies. Lady, sorry. Um, yeah, as Des mentioned, um, to keep saying during lockdown, I did I did about nine of these. Not all the same person, of course. Uh, a lot of aircraft, and uh, one of my favourites would have been Sir Leonard Cheshire, BC. That was most interesting. <coughs> okay, the man who saved the world. That was a term that was given to Keith Park by historians both during and after the Second World War. Sir Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Rodney Park, got a whole lot of letters after his name. Lord Tedder, Chief of Air Staff, uh, February 1947, um, said of Keith Park, if any man won the Battle of Britain, he did. If any, I do not believe that has realised that how much that one man, with his leadership and his skill, did to save not only his country, but the world. Even um, Douglas Bader, who uh, they had an acrimonious relationship with, at his um, uh, memorial in 1977, said, the awesome responsibility for the country's survival rested squarely on Keith Park's shoulders. Air Chief Marshal Sir Stephen Dalton in 2010 at the memorial for or the unveiling of the statue said, Park was a man without whom the history of the Battle of Britain could have been disastrously different. He never failed at any task that he was given. Had the Battle of Britain been lost, then Germany would have had air superiority over the Channel uh, in Britain and this would have allowed, and most historians have agreed with this, the successful invasion of Britain. Operation Sea Lion, which is there, was what Germany was going to do, attack from various fronts. The main issue was the port of Dover. So therefore, you know, once you got the port of Dover, you were able to... So, so there were, in fact, 42 divisions of troops poised in France, four divisions of paratroopers, um, which a division uh, is approximately 10 to 15,000 men. So that's what, three quarters of a million? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Take a lot. the odd kraut. <laughs> so once the invasion had been completed, the majority of troops would have then been deployed to take part in the invasion of uh, Russia, leaving behind an occupational force bearing in mind that the US went in the war for another year and then for another year bef since from there before they got the big machine going. Now, as a total aside, and Phil might recognise this. Whoops, sorry. Um, yeah, that, so there's the paratroopers um, doing their practising. Now, this is an aside. Phil might recognise this. We have that in our... our um, in just down there, and I, um, you think, what's that got to do with it? Well, the point I'm making is that this particular engine, a 4360 engine, um, went on the drawing boards, I, I believe, according to my reel, in 1939, because the, the US government were on the honest opinion that Britain was going to lose the war. So they want an engine capable of propelling an aircraft 10,000 miles with 10,000 pounds worth of bombs. Uh, it went into service in 1946. The Spruce Goose, the B-36, the B-50, the Fairchild C-119, uh, had a few. But they built a total of 18,697. Not quite sure where all they went. OK, this is about Park himself. He was born in Thames, New Zealand, uh, 15th of October, 1892, son of James Livington, Livingston Park of Scotland, a geologist with the Thames Mining Company, who later became professor of geology at uh, Otago University. Uh, Park was an undistinguished sort of a person, young man, keen on guns and riding. He was educated primarily at uh, King's College in Auckland until 1902 
then at Otago's High School in Dunedin, following his father's appointment as a Professor of Geology at Otago University. Very distinguished looking chap there. Later he joined the Army as a Territorial Officer, uh, soldier I beg your pardon, in the New Zealand Field Artillery. In 1911, at the age of 19, he went to sea as a purser aboard a collier uh, and around New Zealand, around a coastal shipping. He earned the name Skipper, which was an affectionate term used by the family until his death. So when the First World War broke out, Park left the sea and rejoined his army battery. As a non-commissioned officer, he took part in the Gallipoli landings at Anzac Cove. Park's achievements are recognised and he was commissioned in the field as a second lieutenant. He commanded a battery, uh, an artillery battery during the August 1915 attack of Suvla Bay and endured months along with his troops of squalor in the trenches. So that was, uh, that was taken in, as you say, in Gippoli. During this time, Park took the unusual decision, not sure why, to transfer from the New Zealand Army to the British Army, joining the Royal Horse and Field Artillery. He was evacuated from Gallipoli, having uh, affected, been affected both physically and mentally. During this time there, he particularly admired the leadership and style of the, the Anzac commander, uh, Sir William Broadwood, to such an extent or degree that he used it as a model for his own leadership right throughout his career. As I said, Lieutenant um, General Sir William uh, Burwood commanded the Australian and New Zealand forces. The title, because of its length, caused a bit of confusion with the Postal Service. So a Lieutenant L.A. White suggested to Burwood that it be shortened to ANZAC. The rest, as they say, is, um, is history. In January 1916, Park's battery was shipped to France and took part in the Battle of the Somme with the Royal Horse Artillery. There he, there he learnt the value of aerial reconnaissance, noting Germans' use of aircraft to spot British positions for artillery. Here's an early version of one of the aeroplanes. <laughs> in October 1916, a flight in the British aircra aircraft to gauge the effectiveness of batteries gave him a taste for flying. In October 1916, Park was blown off his horse by a German shell. Wounded, he was evacuated to Britain and medically certified unfit for active service. Which actually means, as far as the cavalry concerned, unfit to ride a horse. So following time to recover, he joined the Royal Flying Corps. Maybe that's where that word corps came from. In the RFC, he learned to fly, and after a spell uh, as an instructor, was posted to 48 Squadron in France in March 1917 at Belle Belvue. Within a week, the squadron moved to the front, and Park flew the new Bristol two-seater fighter a reconnaissance, and soon achieved successes against German fighters. There's another one. Earning on 17th of August uh, the Military Cross for a conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty. He was promoted to captain on the 11th of September and after a break he returned to France and took command of 48 Squadron where he showed his ability as a tough but fair commander by demonstrating discipline, leadership and an understanding of the technical aspects of aerial warfare. I don't think a lot of people understood that. By the end of the war, the strain of command had taken its toll, but he had achieved much as a pilot and a commander. 
He'd earned the, the MC, the DFC, and the French Court de Guerre. Hope you said that right. Um, uh, here, claim five aircraft shot down with 14 damaged. And he was shot down twice without a parachute, obviously. So after, after the war, so the war's moved, after the war, he married the London socialite, uh, socialite Dorothy Parrish. And they were married, in fact, for 53 years. Gosh, that's the same amount of time I've been married. Oh, there's a connection there, isn't there? So the interwar years. After the war, uh, Park was awarded a permanent commission as a captain in the Royal Air Force. And when the new Air Force ranks that came out, uh, he became a flight lieutenant. And he served as a flight commander at the School of Technical Training. That's him looking all suave. The Royal, uh, the RAF School of Technical Training at Holston. I've been there actually. I, they've got a, um, a little net on a, on a pole. Um, in 1922, he was selected to attend the newly formed RAF Staff College. And later being promoted Air Commodore, he also attended the Imperial College what uh, the Royal Defence, the Royal College of Defence. In 1934, he was appointed as Britain's air attaché to Argentina. Now, I'm just going to quote a little piece of English snobbery here. The requirement for the position was for the applicant to be in the first rank intellectually and socially. <laughs> Don't you love that? <laughs> but in reality, Park probably got the position because of his wife, Dot. Because her great-grandfather, Sir Woodbine Parish, had been the charge of fear to Argentina for Britain from 1924 to 1832. So how about that? So here we go with the Second World War years. Summer 1940, any afternoon, any day of the week. After two months, now even the stolid home guard shows signs of impatience. Having worked up a hate, one hates to see it wasted. Why not come and get it over with? But still the barbed wire along 2,000 miles of coast catches little else but unlucky fish. Yet, in one way, he does come, hand in force. Any time, any day of the week. Eighty plus, assembling over areas Amiens, Abbeville. Further sixty plus, over vicinity of Dieppe. Control advised. First radar reports tend toward the probability of the targets being fighter airfields southeast and east of London. In other words, to control, it looks the same as it did this morning. But too early to judge. It could be London itself. All available squadrons at readiness. Let's hear from the Observer Corps as soon as possible. So it's the airfields again. Scramble five squadrons, Manston and Lim.
Hampton, Sussex, summer 1940. Any afternoon, any day of the week. unloading on Biggin Hill. That's the fourth time for Biggin Hill this week. But they won't be doing it for long. More reports from radar. Another 40 plus over Abbeville and Boulogne. Is this another major effort or is it that convoy in the channel that they're after? All right, scramble four squadrons, Debden. No doubt about it now. It's the convoy in the Straits of Dover. Stukas again. But they're taking a chance. They're dead meat for fighters. Now they're giving the harbor a few on the side for luck. The nerve. All squadrons now engaging. Observer Corps reports enemy breaking it off already. Losses on both sides. Hard to tell yet who's and how many. Well, that's it, it seems, for today. Please, uh... So there's a wee snippet of um, that I caught on YouTube. Lovely place, YouTube. Uh, so. Uh, Park was promoted to the rank of Air Vice Marshal and he took command of 11 Squadron, which you can see in yellow, which bear, bore the brunt of all the fighting. He, or, he also organised fighter patrols uh, over France during the Dunkirk invasion, uh, evacuation, I beg your pardon, and in the Battle of Britain, his 11 group took the brunt of the fighting uh, for most of it, especially over London. Uh, he, he also resisted pressure from Churchill and the French government to send more aircraft to France because he knew what was coming and did not to lose any more aircraft. That's the um, Umbridge bunker where Park ran the day-to-day -day operations. He was living in a house not far from here, uh, from, the, from that operation and he would go through a gate at the bottom of the garden. Apparently the house is all gone, but the gate and the wall is still there. Uh, that was a, oh, probably one, that's a bit long, the Oxford bunker visit by a, um, somebody which is, which is really quite good. Um, but I was gonna get on to about Hugh Dow Dowding. So he controlled the battle from day to day, but it was Keith Park who controlled it hour by hour. Air Vice Marshal Johnny Johnson uh, said, who was one of the top aces of the war, said he was the only man who could have lost the war in a day or even an afternoon. And it's recognised that Park didn't really receive the widespread public recognition or in Britain or in his native New Zealand. Um, he has a claim to be one of the greatest commanders uh, in the, of aerial warfare. Flying his personalised hunt, hunter, Hawker Hurricane, hunter, Hawker Hurricane, around his fighter airfields during the battle, he gained a reputation as a screw tactician, an astute grasp of, grasp of strategic issues, and a hands-on commander.
No, sir, it's not Charlie. Some hurricane out of juice, very likely. Right. Well, call me directly you hear anything. Well, somebody must have spotted him. He can't just disappear. All right, I'll hang on. Sir, it's Air Vice Marshal Park. That's all we need now. Jamie, hang on to this. Good afternoon, sir. Tell your men to relax. How are they making out, Canfield? Half the squadron are new pilots, sir. That's why you were sent here, to lick them into shape. They get less warning here than any other station, so they must learn to get up from standby in two minutes flat if they're to intercept the enemy. Hello, dispersal. Right. Stand down, A flight. Yours? Yes, sir. The chaps spoil her. All right, Canfield, what's up? You have a pilot missing. Yes, sir. Over the channel. Is he much overdue? Over two hours. I thought I'd made it clear we're too near the enemy for pilots to go swanning around on their own. We can't afford to lose them this way. What's the excuse this time? Under carriage check? Instruments. Mm, yes, well, we've all done it, but that's no excuse. What's his name? Pilot Officer Lambert, sir. That you have seen was an excerpt from the Battle of Britain movie. What was that, 86? 1986, was it? Quite, quite a... goes back a fair way, doesn't it? When they, when they made that film. I think a lot of the uh, German aircraft came from Spain, if I recall. Yeah. Weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> So um, one of Park's tactics, he wanted his pilots, he's quite ruthless in what he wanted. Um, he wanted to use a, for bombers, use a frontal attack where possible. There's several advantages. Uh, lightly armoured, not a lot of guns towards the front. Um, the lead planes are generally flown by their better pilots. And they had tight formation so that it was more difficult to be able to manoeuvre. And once they did manoeuvre, then they became... Uh, easy picking. So, following the Battle of Britain and the postponement of Operation Sea Lion, um, things relaxed slightly. So the crisis, that particular crisis, was over. But he had become embroiled in an acrimonious dispute with the ambitious Lee Mallory. Um, who, who, along with Douglas Barter, was putting forward the big wing. Now, one of the, you know, you could, I could spend all night talking about the big wing versus the other wing, <laughs> um, but I won't. Uh, just suffice to say that, um, in actual fact, the, the big wing ran quite a muck amongst uh, 11 groups area, causing issues, uh, in particularly for the radar stations. You know, there's, you know, are the enemy coming, what, you know, all this. Um, uh, Lee Mallory and his wife uh, died in 1944 in a York, Avro York plane which crashed in the French Alps uh, while en route to Burma, where he was going to take up the position, the position of Air Commodore Southeast Asia. A subsequent inquiry found um, that bad weather and Lee Mallory's insistence that the flight continue against uh, aircrew advice as the prime cause of the accident. Mm. So Park's subsequent objection to Lee Mallory's behaviour during the, during the Battle of Britain probably contributed to his and Downing's, Downing's removal from command. However, in Park's autobiography by author Vincent Orange, he has a slightly different take on it. He suggests there may not be any sinister, nothing sinister at all, a bit like the, the US elections. 
Um, one, Dowding had already passed the age of retirement and had been kept on to see them through the crisis. Whoops, sorry. The crisis for which the moment had actually passed. Although Park had only been with 11 Group for one year, he'd been with Fighter Command for a full term and was recognised that the time with 11 Group was really quite stressful for him. And so they were decided, and given his injuries during the First World War, that he should be rested. Uh, in January 42, he went to Egypt as air officer commanding, but however, was posted to Malta uh, in July 1942 as commander air defence of the island. And he used the same fight at small fighter tactics um, as he had uh, during the Battle of Britain, which was successful. So it's an interesting aside, an appreciation of Park standing in 11 Group was reinforced by a visit to 11 Group during the Battle of Britain by the Canadian Billy Bishop, one of the most famous and decorated pilots of World War I, now Air Vice Marshal in the Canadian Air Force. He, he said, he quoted as saying, he impressed me more than any other man I've ever met. That's quite a big statement, isn't it? So um, he was again promoted to Commander-in-Chief uh, East Command, a position he held until the end of the war. Now I have a sound, so, oops, where's it going? There, there you go. I have a sound bite here, which I shall play. Uh, of Keith Park. My experience in 1917-18 in the Royal Flying Corps was absolutely indispensable to me when later on in 1940 I was commanding the fight of the defences in the south of England, first of all covering the retreat from Dunkirk and then throughout 1940 and especially in the, during the Battle of Britain. The reason I say this is that we were again fighting the same enemy, the Germans, and I knew they were very good natural warriors, brave, well disciplined, good fighters in, on the ground and in the air. I would also learned that they were slow to adapt themselves when a set plan on the ground or in the air, a set plan was thrown out of gear by weather or the enemy's surprise action. In 1926, when I was a squadron leader, <coughs> I was the air staff officer to a very famous airman called Air Marshal Sir John Salmon. In 1926, I was recalled from service in Egypt to help him reform the air defences of Great Britain, which had been disbanded in 1919 after the First World War. It was based on the principle of a, a concentration of fighters at selected stations, um, which had to be connected up to a central or focal point where the one commander had by, by those days, by telephone, he could dispatch and control his fighters up to the time they left the ground. And in the air, of course, at that time there was no, the radio telephones were existing in 1926, but they were very elementary. But the intention was to pass the orders from the one central commander. In 1940, I held that position as, as an officer, uh, air officer commanding 11 fighter group. The Central Command Post issued orders by telephone to its um, six, in my case six, and the last period was between the 8th of September and the 6th of October when Goering concentrated his day bombers on London, the London docks, aircraft factories and other, other cities in the south of England. That was really his major tactical error because I think now that had he carried on for another 
week or ten days hammering my fighter aerodromes, I think he might have had them right out of action, in which case we would have... Uh, from the middle of August to the 7th of September, Goering made a, an all-out effort to destroy my <coughs> aircraft on the ground, my hangars, workshops and other installations and all my fighter stations in the south of England. A very determined attack. Three or four times a day the raids came and they were always after the aerodromes. At times they put places like Biggin Hill, Kenley, Hornchurch, all these were vital fighter aerodromes. At the time they were put out of action for an hour or several hours until we filled in the bomb craters and made them possible to land on. Um, I would think that during the first week in September, I was a very worried man. I was a very worried man then because I was short of, short of pilots. That was the thing that worried me. Frankly, I was never worried about the supply of aircraft because a chap called Beaverbrook well, had been put in by uh, Mr. Churchill as uh, head of the aircraft production. And he used to ring up my my house every evening at midnight and ask how many aircraft, hurricanes and fighters had I lost, um, what replacements were required the next day. He used to ring up personally every night to get the score. Um, in point of fact, long before he rang up, his staff had run up and asked me the same questions five or six hours earlier, and they were getting on with the replacement. But the fact remains, as the commander on the front line at that time, it was very heartening to have the, have the director of um, aircraft production ringing up personally every night and without fail. I was never really grounded through lack of aircraft, although we were nearly grounded through lack of pilots on many occasions. Yes, yes. We were, we were short of pilots from early in the battle, uh, owing to bad planning on the part of the, the Air Ministry's training department. After the battle was over, truly won, I was sent to Flying Training Command for a year to take over the training of our of fighter pilots. And the first thing I learned to my amazement was that fighter command, uh, that the Flying Training Command had never heard throughout 1940, they'd never been told by anybody that we were desperately short of pilots. Okay, that's a little sound snot that goes on for a fair while and uh, the voice quality sort of deteriorates slightly. So Park retired in 1946 and was promoted to Air Chief Marshal in that year and re returned to New Zealand. Park was asked by Churchill to personally chose the Spitfire that was to be donated by the British government in recognition of New Zealand pilots who flew and any man ca cases died in the Battle of Britain. That aircraft resides uh, in the Auckland Museum. Back in New Zealand, he took up a number of civic duties and in 1962 was elected to the Auckland City Council. And while a council, he was councillor, he was instrumental in, in getting the government to buy the land at Mangaree and what to build the airport. Hands up those who went to that opening. <laughs> it was brilliant, wasn't it? Yeah. Hey? I think the Americans liked us then. What year was that? 1966. 66. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. That's all right. So Keith Park died in Auckland in September, February 1975, aged 82. So in recognition, a permanent memorial has been unveiled to a pilot who played a key role in defeating the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain. The bronze statue of New Zealander Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Park was unveiled in London today. John Ryle reports for British Forces News. A Spitfire and Hurricane fly past over central London this afternoon marked the 70th anniversary of Battle of Britain Day and below a statue was unveiled to one of the great heroes of those dark days of World War II. Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Park, a New Zealander who so brilliantly commanded the squadrons that defended London and the South East from the Luftwaffe in the summer of 1940. 
Battle of Britain veterans, military chiefs and leading politicians gathered for the event. Keith Park was out there doing things. He got his own hurricane and he was flying around 11 Group all the time, which was good because the chaps in 11 Group knew that he was one of them because he was flying a hurricane around their aerodromes. He certainly was a very popular man amongst uh, the squadron uh, pilots of fighter command and uh, uh, I, I think uh, there will be so many people still alive today I think who will be so pleased that he's being honoured in this way. First to speak was Terry Smith who led the campaign for the memorial. The Battle of Britain was the most important campaign in the history of the RAF. That it was fought and won was down to three men. The first was Winston Churchill. He decided to fight it. The second was Hugh Dowding. He built the system that made victory possible. The third was Keith Park. He wielded the weapon that Dowding had forged and Churchill decided to use. The current chief of the air staff said Keith Park was crucial to Britain's victory. Park was determined that every Hurricane and Spitfire pilot who could find an aeroplane would fly and fight and win that control of the air and inflict unsustainable losses on the enemy bombers, which, as you know, in the weeks to come, would allow Fighter Command to achieve their remarkable victory in the Battle of Britain. The Sir Keith Park Memorial Campaign was launched in March last year by Battle of Britain pilots, serving RAF officers and Sir Keith's family. John Ryle, Forces News, Central London. Now, I had the privilege to have known Sir Keith. He was a patron of the Royal, sorry, of the, the Ryder Cheshire Foundation, founded by Sue Leonard Cheshire VC and his wife Sue Ryder. They have um, homes for people with TB and homeless people around the world. They have one, I think, um, in uh, South Auckland. My father-in-law was on the committee, so our paths crossed a, a couple of times. He was ramrod straight, quietly spoken, and engaging to talk to. However, I have to admit that at the time, I was in my early 30s, he was in his 80s, and to me, he was just an Auckland City Councillor. I didn't appreciate until now. I should have, I should have appreciated more then. So Keith Park in New Zealand is com um, commemorated by the Sir Keith Park Memorial Airfield at Thames and at the aviation section of the Museum of Transport and Technology. And the gate garden up there is a replica of his Hawker Hurricane. Uh, we have a display in Classic Flyers. A permanent uh, bronze statue of Sir Keith was finally unveiled. So it was a special moment for us in the Royal Air and Oil Society to attend the unveiling of Sir Keith Park statue in Thames of April last year. Um, okay, in conclusion, so British military history of the last century has been enriched with the names of great fighting men from New Zealand. Of all ranks and in every one of our services, Keith Park's name will be carved into history along with those of his peers. He will always be known as the man who saved the world. Thank you.